Africa is unfortunately experiencing another record year of forced displacement. This continues as a steady upward trend since 2011. More than 32 million Africans are either internally displaced, refugees, or asylum seekers, up from 29 million a year ago. The sources of Africa's population displacement are highly concentrated. Ten African countries account for about 88 uh, percent of all forcibly displaced people on the continent. We're joined today by Her Excellency Madam Tony Ojora Saraki and Mr. Isaac Kwaku Fuku. Uh, Mrs. Tony Ojora Saraki is, of course, the founder and president of the Wellbeing Foundation Africa and is a global advocate for women and children's health and empowerment. Mr. Isaac Kwaku Fuko Jr. is a founder of Botho Emerging Markets Group, an international investment and strategy advising firm and co-founder of the Amahoro Coalition, an African-led initiative convening private sector leaders to advance economic inclusion for displaced populations. So two perfect individuals to talk about this situation. Uh, uh, Mr. You're both welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Mr. Fuko Jr., let me, let me start with you. Forced displacement reaching a record high over the past decade. Can you talk to us about uh, this inaugural forum, its theme, how it came about, and most importantly, the significance of it? Thank you so much, and good morning to you and your listeners. Uh, thank you for having us today. Um, you know, Africa, uh, currently there are about 82 million people who are either refugees or displaced globally. The African continent has about half of that number, yet we represent 16% of the global population. So clearly, there's a disproportionate number of refugees or displaced individuals residing in the continent. And we believe that there is more that we need to do toward the conversation. Um, this is the theme for this year's event the, is uh, 36 million solutions. And the theme represents the, co a collective, I mean, the need for a collective effort to do more in this environment, to make sure that no African is left behind, that we find and identify the right resources to ensure that uh, young and older African men and women who are um, in these uh, vulnerable situations find a way to, um, uh, to find a sort of life themselves and also to educate themselves in their future. So that's what the theme is about, and that's why we're doing what we're doing this year never, at the end of November in Excellent. Kigali. Excellent stuff. Thank you so much. It's, it's been making headlines everywhere, and it's a very, very uh, you know, important initiative. Thank you so much. Um, Honorable Madam Tuin Saraki, I understand you recently visited uh, Adagom refugee settlement in Ogoja in Cross River State, and you actually met with Cameroonian refugees. Can you please share with us uh, that experience? First of all, it was, it was a huge honor and a privilege, actually, to usher in my birthday with the refugees of the Adagom resettlement community in Ogoja, Cross River State. Adagom is a community full of vibrance and resilience. But like so many other displaced communities, it is burdened with a lack of resources and basic provisions in health, education, and access to gainful livelihoods for people who have been forced to flee. The COVID-19 also affected those communities disproportionately, most especially the women and the girls therein, who are in need of regular and routine maternal health support and timely antenatal care. You know, I was very impressed with the work of UNHCR in Adagom and also with the host community and the government agencies that surround because a lot of the time host communities don't want strangers joining them. But Adagom, in my opinion, is a best practice model where it's almost like a mini city that has grown and the people around who lived there before have accepted them. But we have to ask act very fast to get these resettlement communities back on track and to ensure that no woman, no expectant mother, no girl child, no boy child is left behind. And that's why I actually joined hands with UNHCR, UNHCR Nigeria, and UNHCR private sector partnerships who support these vulnerable communities across Nigeria and across the continent and across the world by protecting and empowering displaced men, women and youth, and to promote social and economic inclusion and foster good relationships within their local communities. No one is truly safe until everyone is safe. And I was very pleased to join UNHCR, partnering to ensure that all refugees and displaced people have access to their basic human rights and dignities. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Sarek. There's tons of ways to share a birthday and very selfless of you to, to spend that special day uh, at, uh, with those refugees. Um, Mr. Foucault Jr., let me come back to you. We know that humanitarian assistance has effectively supported displaced populations in emergencies. So why do you believe that a broadened approach is needed to address the forced displacement crisis? 
Yeah, very good question. Look, I think one must give acknowledgement to acknowledgement, acknowledgement is due. First of all, I think African countries and African governments have historically been very open to open up their borders uh, for families and people who are fleeing violence from their own communities. And I think that's a very good thing. Um, the interesting thing is that when it comes to our continent, one of the challenges is that we have a lot of protracted um, um, issues, right? So it's one thing to be in a temporary refugee settlement for a few months or a few years. But in Africa, you have generations of people who've lived there for over 30 years. And our governments just don't have the capacity uh, to, to make sure that they, they meet this burden. In addition to governments, one must also give credit um, to what the UNHCR does, the UN Agency for, um, for uh, the UN Refugee Agency. They do a very good job of making sure they work with, um, work with implementing partners on the ground. But also, we have to understand that the UNHCR works on, you know, voluntary contributions, right? Their budgets are based on how much money they receive from other people. So why do you need a broadened approach? Well, because there's a big delta, there's a big difference between what is needed and what is received. And I believe, we believe that, you know, increasingly, the Africa private sector needs to do its part in, in part of the conversation. Um, and so I think despite this, this generosity, more resources are needed and more, more interventions are needed to make sure that we are able to provide for the you know, millions of individuals who are, who are, who are caught in this case. Let, let's, let's take Nigeria, for instance. Nigeria had over 3 million uh, displaced people and about 74,000 uh, refugees, from, from, from what I understand. And so imagine if every, and yes, Nigeria, as you know, the largest you know, continent, country in Africa, and uh, Nigeria also is, is, is home to some of the most vibrant and most exciting entrepreneurs on the continent. So imagine if Nigerian private sector actors got together to work with governments, to work with UNHCR to help solve this solution. In Nigeria alone, for the three million, the three million I'm talking alone, that's the broadened approach we're talking about. So the whole idea is that the idea of this forum is to unite, is to bring together industry leaders, private sector experts, high network individuals, civil society, and, and everyone in between to do their part to help solve this uh, issue. And then one last thing about that is that I, I think it's also high time that, you know, a lot of something I see all the time is that my parents' generation fought for independence in Africa. They did a tremendous job fighting against colonization. The, the revolution we have now in our generation of young people or, 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 on African continent, and business leaders on the African, the African continent, is to make sure that we help to build greater prosperity for all our people. Part of that greater prosperity story lies in this conversation that we're having. So the broader the net, the, 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 the broader the conversation, the more we get involved, the more we can, we can work toward greater prosperity and bring solutions for all Africans. Thank you so much, sir. That's, that's a staggering number. Three million people displaced in Nigeria. That's more than the population of Namibia, I think. Um, uh, thank you so much, Ms. Fukujuna. Um, Madam Saraki, uh, Her Excellency, what role will the private sector play in helping to rebuild the lives of people that were forced to flee? You know, I'd like to always say that Africa's private sector has always been positioned as a critical agent of productivity, of prosperity, and of change. As investors in refugee hosting communities, as partners, donors, or employers, the private sector made up of national and multinational companies, foundations, and individuals can step into the humanitarian relief space to support innovative responses to the urgent and critical needs of the vulnerable communities. The private sector in Africa has been at the forefront of creating solutions that lift thousands, hundreds of thousands of marginalized and underserved communities out of abject poverty, but very often forcibly displaced people who represent some of these most vulnerable communities on our continent are overlooked and therefore do not fully benefit from the innovative solutions and social investment programs spearheaded by the private sector in Africa. In facing these highest levels of forced displacement in history and in the world, we need a multi-stakeholder approach to the displacement crisis. And that approach is critically needed now. I think the private sector can support forcibly displaced persons, not just to survive, but also to thrive through innovative shared value partnerships. This could include sharing of expertise, building skills, creating economic opportunities, and also investing in their inclusion. We can play a major role in rebuilding the lives of people that were forcibly by harnessing their capacity and turning their displacement challenges into development opportunities. In recent years, we have entered the era of increased social responsibility awareness, and this transition also involved new business practices so we can actually harness these people to generate new revenues while contributing to tackling the displacement challenges and why they left in the first place. We have large flows of displacement 
uh, populations in these host country communities, but we can look at that as large opportunities as well. I think it's up to the private sector to use their expertise to identify the opportunities and open up markets, upgrade infrastructure, create jobs and income, and also give them a sense of significance and self-reliance. Making use of market systems will also give us greater access to products and services that improve both the quality of life of displaced populations and also the host communities. For instance, just the provision of wash facilities and products, particularly for women, will help to sustain the dignity of people who are already in a fragile situation. I'm very confident that the private sector can provide training, apprenticeships, on-the-job training to upgrade the people who are displaced skills so that they are fully integrated, not just physically into our communities, but also economically, so that we too can benefit from the skills and capacities that they are going to bring towards us. It's a very, very exciting opportunity. And I have refugees, they're very intelligent, very hardworking, very highly skilled. So the fact that they were forced to flee should not mean that they will be forced never to work again. I think that the work that they can bring to our systems can also grow our own economies. It's a great opportunity, and I'm hoping that the private Krista. sector in the... Krista, we have to take a quick, quick break. We'll be right back to continue the conversation. Uh, do stay tuned on the Global Business Report. Welcome back to the Global Business Report on Rise News. We're still having this important conversation on forced displacement and what the private sector can do in order to be able to assist in assisting these uh, forced displaced folks. We just heard from uh, Madam uh, Saraki, Her Excellency, and now I want to go back to Mr. Isaac uh, uh, Foucault, Jr. Uh, sir, who should attend the Africa Private Sector Forum on Forced Displacement and what can they expect to get out of the forum? Uh, thank you. You know, it's interesting when uh, Her Excellency was talking, I, it occurred to me that, you know, refugees and displaced individuals are individuals who, through no fault of their own, have to leave their environment, local environment, right? And so, you know, you talk about being vulnerable. It's the classic definition of vulnerability. So who do we expect to be at this event? Well, we expect a variety of different people, because like, like I said earlier, we want to broaden the tent. Uh, we expect business leaders, industry experts, uh, philanthropists, foundations, civil society members, and anybody wants to be part of this conversation uh, because we want people who are solution oriented. Um, the idea of this event is not to be another talk shop. We are not planning to make a gallery to, you know, talk forever about issues and problems. We are there to solve problems. So we are expecting people who are, and we encourage people who are in that sort of mindset and mind frame to come to Kigali and, and work with us on the, on these, on these solutions. You know, I tell people that Africans are very charitable, but we need to also now learn to be more philanthropic. And I think there's a difference in those two conversations. So individuals who are wired that way and, and, and uh, companies, you know, individuals who are wired that way, I think that's what they were expect, uh, expecting to come. What, what can they expect? Well, they, they can expect to come and listen to individuals who are actually working this journey themselves. We are going to have individuals in Kigali who are themselves refugees and displaced people who are doing amazing things, who are entrepreneurs, who are business leaders, who are leaders in their own right who are doing amazing things to further their own cause on the continent and doing their part for the collective African prosperity. They're also going to be, they're also going to expect to receive a very intimate setting where we are doing our best to create what I call a network effect. So creating a community of leaders and people who are committed to humanitarian causes across the continent, specifically when it comes to refugees and displaced people. Um, they can also expect to be part of the conversation about redefining and, you know, uh, entrenching Africa's um, philanthropic culture. We have many philanthropists in the continent, excellence is one of them, but we need to build an cadre of philanthropists across the continent and bring more younger people into this conversation and find more innovative ways to be philanthropic across the continent. And so those are the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about and they can expect. Um, they can expect to get insight um, around, you know, uh, the displaced population, some of the numbers that we shared earlier, understand the scope of the problem, but also more importantly, I think, understand why it matters. Because I think a lot of times we have these conversations and we go to dinner, we go to lunch, we go for meetings, we forget about it. We have to understand that our collective history, our collective future is based on, you know, the, the ability as Africans to build a continent together. So I think those are the kinds of things that we have people to expect to, uh, to gain uh, if they come to this event. Um, like I said, it's not going to be a talk shop. It's going to be, a, you know, a mix of experiential learning activity. It's going to be, um, you know, um, uh, inspirational, different sections, what have you. And it's going to be fun. Um, fun in a positive way, not fun in a light way, but fun, fun in a positive way. And so we encourage, you know, leaders who are, who are willing to take, go on this journey with us to join us in uh, Rwanda at the end of the month. 
Great stuff. And I, uh, Mr. Foucault, I just wanted to follow up on something. You mentioned uh, youth involvement, and we've talked a lot about youth involvement. How, how dedicated is the forum to making sure that there is a, a, you know, a presence of youth at uh, what it is that you're doing? The, the, centrality, the, the, the central idea of this whole thing is for, the, for youth and also for folks who are getting displaced and refugees. Um, I am not one of these people who believe, that, who believe that the future of Africa is the youth. What I believe is that the future of Africa is now, and the youth are leading now. So these youth are not leading, leading tomorrow, they're leading right now. And I think that folks who come to Kigali and folks who follow this story will, will learn and observe and understand very amazing young men and women who are doing fantastic things across the African continent under the most dire situation, situations. And imagine, it's in, I mean, uh, Her Excellency was talking about, you know, things about like apprenticeships and internships. Imagine the opportunity a young person can get given just an internship with a major financial institution in Nigeria, a, a major manufacturing company in Nigeria. What that does for the person's community, the market sourcing that can build, right? What that does for the future of that person and their community. So, yes, to answer your question, we are going to, it's going to be very youth focused. We're going to have a lot of youth talking at the event, not as, not as what I call props, but as a central conversation. Because it is, about, it is about the youth, it is about the future of the continent, and it is about this, these vulnerable populations. Thank you so much. So, uh, Her Excellency, uh, Madam Saraki, I would also like to get your thoughts on not only youth participation, also uh, women as well. If you'd like to chime in, please. You know, most definitely, we cannot leave 50% of our population behind, and we won't be leaving 50% of our female refugee population behind. These are women who were forced to flee. But when they arrived, the ones I met in Patagon, they immediately created new homes, began to teach their children. They have self-help groups. But these are also women that want to work. A lot of them have actually done new courses from within that camp. So what I'm hoping is that the private sector will begin to look at the risk end. You know, at the moment, there are certain policy and regulatory frameworks that are bottlenecks for the private sector involvement. I'm hoping that out of this conference, the private sector will understand better the long-term needs of displaced persons and host communities as potential consumers and clients sensitive to the local context and be vigilant and well-equipped for the associated risk. I'm also hoping that the private sector will begin to explore solutions like the creation of economic zones with preferential trade access for refugee-made goods and where domestic as well as foreign investors can relocate their supply chains so the private sector will be able to use the opportunities for cross-sector partnership that bring about synergy and leverages such as public-private partnerships, blended financing, shared collateral and security with government and NGOs to complement efforts already in place. Across Africa, the major bar to women's entrepreneurship is actually the cultural attitude that women should not own property. And this is highlighted even more in a refugee woman who has left everything behind to come and resettle mm. in a safer climate. So I'm hoping that the private sector, who are so used to innovating, will put their own eye on this refugee resettlement issue and bring out together with the entire group there and the UNHCR a new paradigm for resettling refugees and allowing them to be economically viable. Thank you so much, uh, Her Excellency. And, and we, time for, I guess, closing remarks from the, from the both of you. Mr. Foucault Jr., I want to start with you. Uh, any uh, final thoughts, parting thoughts for us uh, as, we, as we close? Um, sure, thank you very much. Look, I, I just want to reiterate the, the historic nature of what we're, we're doing at the end of this month. And historic not because of Akula, but historic in terms of, you know, more and more, I think, as a continent, we are, we, are, we, are, we are doing our part to own our own conversations. And I think this is one more step toward that. I think the story of displaced persons in Africa and refugees in Africa has long been happening. Um, we, are not, we, are not, we are not new to conflict on the continent. Uh, that's a different conversation. But for this particular conversation, I think that what we're doing and inviting the private sector, private sector actors to join this conversation in, um, in, in providing opportunities and also finding solutions for refugees and displaced persons, I think it's something that, that's... Um, that we encourage everyone to be part of because I think it's, it's, it's something that's very important. Um, I also want to also want to just you know just as a plug, just read the event is uh, November thirtieth to December second in Kigali. It's it's a live event. It's a hybrid event, but we encourage leaders to come uh, into Kigali to, Kigali to be part of this competition. Um, and we look forward to uh, welcoming folks uh, to join us. Thank you very much for this opportunity.
Thank you so much. We're almost out of time. Uh, Her Excellency, and I'm sorry, if you could briefly give us your uh, closing remarks, well, we really appreciate it. Oh, well, I'll just reiterate that alongside the 74,000 refugees that we host in Nigeria, we have 3 million internally displaced persons of our own. Now is the time for Nigerians to step up to the plate, to help forcibly displace Nigerians and Africans through innovative solutions. I strongly encourage the Nigeria private sector to represent themselves and to participate fully in this historic gathering. I look forward to seeing everyone at Kigali. Thank you so much. Her Excellency, Madam Tony Saraki and Mr. Isaac uh, Kwaku Fukuo Jr., thank you so much for talking to us. We appreciate uh, your insights. That's going to do it for the Global Business Report. Do stay tuned to Arise News. From all of us, thank you so much for your company. Thanks for watching.